You've tuned into another edition of The Break Room, a weekly conversation about how the city of St. Augustine works from those who do the work every day. Hosted by the city of St. Augustine's communications director, Melissa Whistle, The Break Room offers a closer look at the different city departments and provides updates on current and upcoming projects and events. And now your host, Melissa Whistle. Hello, and thanks for tuning in. You're listening to The Break Room. I'm Melissa Whistle, communications director for the city of St. Augustine. We have another fair welcome episode this week. If you've been tuning in on a regular basis, you know what that means. We're bidding farewell to someone who is leaving one position and at the same time welcoming their replacement. In this case, today we are talking about the city's planning and building director. Outgoing director David Bertram has just moved offices around the corner. He's been promoted to assistant city manager. And also with a promotion is Amy Skinner. She is now our planning and building director. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to have you both. So not a lot of changes in the sense that you both have been here. Amy, I want to ask you to start. Uh, You've been with the city uh, about 15 years or so. You started as a planning technician. Give us a little bit of your story of how long you've been with the city. What what do you have going on? Uh, I started with the city way back in 1989. I was with the city for about eight years. Um, That was during the initial time where the comprehensive plan was adopted that sets the framework for today and what planning is I think I guess for today we also did a major rezoning at the same time that set the zoning districts for the city that are still basically in place for today I left the city uh, in 1997 and I did some consulting for 10 years I worked for the city of Benel for seven years and helped them with their comprehensive plan and then uh, luckily, I came back to the city in 2014, and, and I've enjoyed it um, being you're, back. You're here to stay. I'm here We're to stay. We're glad to have you, and Thank congratulations you. On, on being promoted to director. I appreciate it. It's very exciting for me. You have uh, you mentioned something interesting, which is so critical to so much of what we do, I mean, in any city, I'm sure, but is those zoning r- r- guidelines, boundaries. Can you tell me a little bit about the boundaries or what they are? So they're are established zoning districts for the city that basically outline the permitted uses and the types of uses allowed in different areas. It ranges from like residential uses all the way through commercial uses, some industrial uses, and some mixed-use categories in in between. It basically kind of sets what's allowed and the conditions that people have to build under. Um, I think we're seeing the success of the city um, in that respect because they've been established for so long and we've kind of been able to consistently um, execute the plan, I guess right. you would say, for so long that now uh, we we see the benefits. Well, and, and that's so much of what we're seeing people wanting to come in and change something or they want to make a modification. So it's so important that we have those zoning rules and guidelines that that keep us on point of how we want our city to be. Another aspect I think of our success is that we've been able to consistently apply these zoning districts and the regulations. So um, from any type of of investment, like Mm -hmm. a residential investment, people buying Mm -hmm. um, property in the city, they've been able to rely on the zoning districts and the comprehensive plan being in place right. that kind of, that helps um, sort of guarantee the a re, a value on your right. on your uh, investment. So. Which which you mentioned the the zoning and the residential. I know uh, to touch on a slightly touchy subject. You know we've got the short term rentals, and that a lot of times comes back to let's look at the zoning. That's so important. That's that is a touchy subject. You know I think it's an interesting subject. Uh, the state of Florida has, you know, preempted our ability mm-hmm. uh, to regulate short-term rentals in a lot of ways. Most people probably would inherently consider them a commercial type use, sure. But um, we have to consider it kind of an extension of a residential use, and we do have certain regulations in place. Luckily, we did have them in place regarding, you know, time limits in some areas, and we do now have some other regulations that are in place. We are waiting to see what will happen this legislative session and and uh, we'll find out what else, what we can continue right. to enforce. What lies ahead. And you've been able to, um, you guys started that, but that's really become a code enforcement pro- um, there, we, ish, um, 
it's it's moved over to code enforcement in terms of the regulation of it or pursue our uh, enforcement. Yes, it's right. uh, basically our code enforcement division is responsible for um, implementing the program related right. to short term rentals. Uh, we have a code enforcement manager. We have a code enforcement inspector that specifically addresses registrations for people have to register in order to do a short term rental. Right. Uh, they also have to meet certain. Um, building and life safety codes. We want to make sure they're safe. And right now we do have a parking requirement. And so it's our co-enforcement division that walks people through that process, gets them registered. We actually now have over 430 registered um, short-term rental wow. units. Uh, we are monitoring or we have monitored mm -hmm. in some form oh, another 200 over the last uh, year or two. Wow. So it's it's... Definitely yeah. an yeah. issue. But now it gives you time to be able to do planning and building things right. so that it's been. Um, and David, you're sitting here so quietly. But we'll mm -hmm. talk a little bit too. You started out uh, in the planning and building department. Had your career there? I did. I started in 1997 as a planner too, uh, which is an entry level position and just worked my way up. Yep. And um, I've been with the city for 24 years. And you've seen a lot of change in the city. In terms of where what it looked like when you got here, rules and regulations have changed, and the the dynamic in the city is totally different. A lot's changed. Yeah. I mean, the city itself, um, when I got here, really was a small town, um, small community, and it has gentrified so much um, that it's it's the whole character of the community has changed in a lot of ways, and the character of of City Hall has changed also. Mm -hmm. When when I first started working. For example, we didn't have uh, internet access in really? City Hall. We didn't have cell phones. Right. Um, we did everything on paper. Sure. We didn't have uh, GIS mapping capabilities at that point, so all of our mapping was done by hand. So it, it, it was a more customer interactive um, environment. Mm -hmm. uh, now it's, it's much more um, interactive through electronic email and, and, and it's less face-to-face -face contact with our customers. But it's, it's a better uh, system in terms of efficiency, mm -hmm. and uh, it's a faster system. I couldn't imagine what we do do today without all of the technology, with our growth and development and building and, and construction and everything that we do, to imagine doing all of that still it's on paper to, and without a cell phone. And it's hard to believe it's changed so much in just 20, 24 years. Right. Um, you know, there was a time when when every time we a staff member uh, – made a phone call we had to log it in on a steno pad really and i don't know where those steno pads With are now just, no was it the carbon copy type <laughs> no we that, just had okay, to write just... down the phone number we made and the time and everything and who we called i don't know why we had to do that but right. There's just got to be stacks and stacks of steno pads with phone numbers on them somewhere. somewhere. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> that's funny. I never, I, yeah, it, you don't think about that kind of stuff yeah. either. You know, Wasn't rotary dial phones and putting people, uh, you know, pushing the button to put them on hold. Yeah, our inspectors had walkie talkies and, uh, you know, young people probably don't even know what those are right, now. <laughs> right. Uh, but it was they, a different era. Yeah. Uh, if you're just now tuning in, you're listening to The Break Room. I have uh, David Burcham, who is our assistant city manager, and Amy Skinner, who is now our planning and building director. David, you've switched gears in some ways, but you're not you're not any stranger to the planning and building department and what you're doing now. Tell us a little bit about what brought about this change for you to go be in the position you're in. I think it's a great change, and it's much needed. Well, they, John moved me. John Regan, the city manager, mm -hmm. moved me up to assistant city manager to oversee some large real estate development projects mm -hmm. that the city is interested in. For example, um, we're interested in building a new fire station on Anastasia Island. Um, we're looking at a, a joint project, a commercial project that involves a, our participation with a, a large parking garage, uh, looking at taking over ownership of King Street. And so that, that type of, those types of projects require not just planning and building oversight, but also participation with all the other um, departments in City Hall. And really, when you're in planning and building, when I was in planning and building, I sort of did the same thing, trying to get everyone to review real estate development projects together. So he pulled me out of planning and building so I could concentrate on these large projects. 
And um, and now Amy's taking over planning and building right. and looking at private sector real estate development stuff. And you're still working, though, with our departments, with public works, utilities, like you say, still with planning and building. Oh, yeah. I'm still doing the same thing. And I'm also looking at and tracking all the bills that are going through the state legislature now. We're going to Tallahassee on Monday to, or Monday and Tuesday to meet with our uh, state representatives. Mm-hmm. And every and then every day something comes up that the city manager wants me to take care of. You know. One of the things that you guys did in planning and building uh, was the historic preservation division. Um, tell me a little bit about how that came about. That's such an important part of planning and building that it became its own thing. If you it will. did, yeah. So again, when I started, um, I was the only planner for the city. So I did all the administration for the planning and zoning board and HARB and, um, but the, the act, the emphasis and and values of the community sort of grew and it, the community really insisted upon having a dedicated staff members look at our historic districts. And so we, we created an historic preservation and archaeology division within the planning and building department. And so we have two full-time professional archaeologists, and we have two full-time professional historic preservation planners that oversee all the changes within our historic districts. And those aren't just the downtown districts. We have national register districts throughout the city and archaeology zones throughout the city. And, and they concentrate on making sure that everything that's done in those areas complies with our local laws our, and also our commitment to federal and state laws that protect his, historic resources. And what people don't realize is, well, or they do realize, we are a historic city. That's our, that's our pride, and we, we hang our hat on that. But you have to be able to preserve it. Uh, not just physically the buildings, but the character and the look of things. And without that, um, we would be lost. Same thing with the the zoning districts. Um, Before we wrap up today, though, Amy, coming back to you, talking historic preservation and the comp plan, tell me a little bit about the comp plan. That's you. That was your baby. And who's going to draw the short stick when that has to come (laughs) up again in seven years? (laughs) We uh, we are required to look at the comp plan, as you mentioned, every seven years. Um, it had been a while since uh, the city's comprehensive plan, I would say, had been kind of rewritten and, and updated. And so luckily I had the opportunity to work on that when I came back. Um, we started in 2018. Uh, it was a pretty, was can I say, big. comprehensive yes. project. Uh, we went, um, David and I went uh, out to many meetings. We scheduled as much outreach as we could uh, to garner input. I think between the fact that the city had done a vision plan Mm -hmm. in 2014, kind of setting, again, the framework of that, we kind of used that to, and we heard people throughout the city and commenting on the issues that they think we needed to address. We updated the comprehensive plan. It um, included a major uh, rewrite of the transportation element that included included mobility, a major update of the historic preservation element, the housing element. We included kind of some frameworks for the affordable housing mm-hmm. uh, that you know has become an issue, as we know. Um, comes in handy. And so we've we tried to set the framework so for any issue that we could anticipate, so that now as you know we move forward with David and myself, we can hopefully you know, develop uh, the programs that will actually implement something on the ground. Which it might take That's some a, right. amendments to the ordinances, but... Yeah. The comp plan is really important, and people don't realize how long it takes for these projects to come into play. We've been talking about Lake Marie Sanchez for years, right. you know, so it, it doesn't happen overnight, but you guys are keeping us in line and steady, and uh, we are out of time Lots of great things to talk about. Thank you both for coming. Thank you. And congratulations to both of you on your new positions. Thank you. We want to keep you informed about what's happening in and around the city. Most importantly, that you hear it here from the people doing the work and making it happen every day. Hope you enjoyed this week's fair welcome. Visit us on the web at citystaynog.com. And if you missed this 
broadcast or any others, you can listen to The Break Room at citystnogradio.com. Until next time. You've been listening to The Break Room, a weekly program addressing projects and programs offered by the City of St. Augustine. Join us each week as the city's communications director, Melissa Whistle, has in-depth conversations with the people who make our town work to meet the needs of our community. The Break Room is produced by communications specialist for the city of St. Augustine, Cindy Walker. See you at this time next week for another edition of The Break Room.